Is Mario moving to the right, or is the level moving to the left? As we open Pandora's box of graphics knowledge for the NES, or any system when it comes to graphics really, the best advice I have is to just learn everything there is to know all at once. That sounds like a tall order, so let's focus on scrolling by way of the following specific topics. Name table, a quick mention of the attribute table, but not much, mirroring, background tiles, scrolling the viewport, and the PPU registers PPU scroll and PPU control. We'll use Super Mario Bros. as a game for reference. Let's go. The system is tile-based, and backgrounds often had a very tiled look to them. There's 2K of VRAM in the Nintendo, and that isn't much space if you expect to hold an entire level's worth of background graphics. Name table refers to one screen's worth of background tiles. The VRAM in the NES provides enough space for two name tables. The makeup of a single name table can be described like this. Backgrounds are made up of tiles that are 8 pixels by 8 pixels. An entire screen's worth of tiles is 32 by 30. In pixels, this would be 256 by 240. If you multiply 32 tiles across by 30 tiles down, you get 960. Each tile is a byte, so 960 bytes worth of background tiles. Obviously, there are a few numbers here, but they should feel pretty straightforward. If you take one number from all of this, take the 960 bytes. Following the name table information is the attribute table. The attribute table stores palette information assigned to sections of our background. Palette information is also broken down into tiles. The explanation for the attribute table is a little complex and outside our focus for this video, but the size of it is relevant. The attribute table is arranged as an 8x8 array on our screen. To describe the makeup involves breaking it down even further, but all we need to know is 8 times 8 is 64. 64 bytes are needed for an attribute table paired with our name table. Let's put the two together in terms of size. 960 bytes from the name table plus 64 bytes from the attribute table requires 1024 bytes for a single screen's background plus associated palette information. Since we have 2K of VRAM, we can hold two screens worth of background information in VRAM at once, 2048 bytes. Here is the first screen of Super Mario Bros. The name table that represents this screen begins here at address 0 of name table RAM, as it is called in the emulator. If I begin to change all of the bytes starting at address 0 to the value of 36 hex, each 8x8 pixel tile turns into a tile containing part of a cloud, starting at the top left of the screen and moving across that topmost row. The attribute data begins after the 960 bytes of our name table tiles at address 3C0. I can begin to replace palette data by overriding these bytes with 50 hex. The rogue clouds I created have turned green. As a bit of trivia, the same tiles used for the clouds are also used to make up some of the flora of the level by way of a simple palette change. So this gives you a bit of background on backgrounds and the associated palette data. A second screen's worth of information would round out the remaining 1K of VRAM. Since we are interested primarily in scrolling for this video, we'll now leave the details of tiles and palettes behind. Now. If you look at documentation for name tables or view the backgrounds in the PPU viewer of an emulator, you will see this. And this is a source of confusion for three reasons. Why are there four backgrounds shown? Why are there duplicates? And what is mirroring? Let's switch gears, put this away, and go conceptual here for a moment. Let's say we have two people, person one and person two. Let's give them names like Corey and Mark, completely random names, of course. Now let's give them titles. Let's call Corey Captain, and Mark can be Overlord. There are now two ways to address Person 1, Corey and Captain, and there are two ways to address Person 2, Mark and Overlord. There aren't four people, there are still two people, and each can be addressed in two ways. We can swap their titles. Now we address the same two people in different ways using titles we already had. They could each legally change their names and adopt the name of their counterpart. Okay, in real life, this would admittedly be pretty confusing. But names and titles aside, the point is they are still the same two people. We've just changed how we address them. Why is this important? Because this is a parallel that helps us better understand how we address the name tables that hold the backgrounds on the NES. Let's return to our Mario example in the name table viewer. 
You can see four backgrounds here, two identical pairs, one pair stacked on top of a duplicate. There are four logical name tables, each with its own unique address, and they are tied to two physical name tables in VRAM, VRAM we modified a moment ago in order to better understand its contents. Because this data represents graphics, it's easier to illustrate these bytes by showing those graphics they represent and even integrating the palette data from the attribute table to give the graphics colors. The problem is that many of us see this in an emulator for the first time and attempt to understand it as a gamer rather than a developer. Let's observe the background graphics, but continue to think of those graphics as just a series of bytes behind the scenes that we address in multiple ways. Time to start talking about scrolling. In our name table viewer, I have enabled the PPU scroll overlay. Since it is rather close to the sky color in Super Mario Brothers, I'll modify the palette and change the color of the sky to purple. I've made the game seem a bit unfamiliar, but that only helps us stay focused on that scroll overlay. Let's also mask the mirrored background graphics while we are at it. We'll get to mirrored stuff near the end of the video. You could call this overlay the camera or viewport for a two-dimensional scrolling game like Super Mario Brothers. At the start of the game, we have one name table plus half a second name table's worth of information currently loaded into VRAM. Mario is free to start walking forward to the right. Once he reaches a certain point, the level begins to scroll. Our camera's starting location has been changed and continues to change as Mario walks to the right. Mario's sprite maintains its own x-coordinate boundary and logic in relation to the screen as the camera moves. Think of Mario and the camera as the two independent objects that they are. Logic has them work together, but they aren't locked together. For example, if Mario reverses direction, the scrolling stops. You can see that we are now using tile data from each of the two name tables in our scroll viewport. As we move to the right, we load more background tiles into our second name table ahead of the camera's right side boundary, about half a screen's worth. As our camera reaches the right half of that second name table, our background tiles that are loaded ahead of the camera run out of space and begin to load on the left side of the first name table and overwrite the tiles of our starting background. Likewise, when the camera pushes beyond the far right side, the viewport wraps around to the left. Very convenient. This wraparound process can continue as needed as Mario moves to the right. Let's now turn our attention to the logic side of this. After a frame is drawn to the TV screen, we reach a section in the video signal called vertical blank. At this point, an NMI or non-maskable interrupt occurs to signal the start of this period. The PPU is done drawing to the screen and can now afford to be informed of any changes for the next frame. Games have a handler for when an NMI occurs, and here is the one for Super Mario Bros. You can already see some PPU register names in dark blue, terms like PPU and Sprite, for example. Let's begin by focusing on a single register of interest a little further down. PPU scroll, referenced via address 2005 hex. I'll omit saying hex from this point forward. At a glance, it would seem we are loading two values from RAM, an X coordinate and a Y coordinate for the scroll window, and we store each of them after their load to the same place? But this isn't a RAM location used for storage. This is a PPU register, and this scroll register expects to be fed an X coordinate and then a Y coordinate for the scroll window. As programmers of the CPU, no additional logic is needed. The PPU is expecting this pair to be written consecutively to this register at this point in our program. If you look at our PPU status section, you'll see a box called Write Toggle. This bit is how the PPU keeps track of which coordinate it expects next. So if we step forward through the program, we load the X coordinate from RAM and note the Write Toggle bit is clear. After writing that X coordinate to the register, the Write Toggle flips to Set. The same process repeats with the Y coordinate, and the right toggle is now clear again. We don't manually toggle this bit, the PPU keeps track of it. 
Now, if the bit is currently set and we want to clear it, or we simply want to initialize it, we can read PPU status register 2002. And if you look at our example code, a read takes place just a few lines earlier. We are set up to feed X and then Y. As a side note, this behavior bit is shared with PPU register 2006. Don't worry about what that register is, just know that this write toggle bit is shared. By the way, there is certainly more to the status register than resetting write toggle, but that is beyond our current scope. Before moving on, let's mess with that PPU scroll register. All we have to do is type a value of our choosing into these RAM locations. At the beginning of Super Mario Bros., a screen and a half of tiles are currently loaded into our name tables. We know the RAM locations for our camera's X and Y coordinates. The values are 0, 0. Let's mess things up. I'm going to jump the camera over almost an entire name table by just typing F0 into our desired camera X location in RAM. Uh-oh. We skipped over all the logic that loads new tiles into VRAM, sets up level objects, and more. Logic we would execute as part of our NMI handler didn't happen. Now, there's a big question mark block right here. So I can jump and get a coin, right? No. Game logic thinks the screen looks like this. The logic has to know that there is a question mark block here in order for anything to happen. This background just serves as wallpaper over what the game logic knows. The graphics we see are no longer synced with object locations. Fortunately, the scrolling, level loading, tile setting, and so forth logic of Super Mario Bros. snaps everything back to reality once I get Mario into that scroll boundary. Watch. There. No harm done. What do you think? That PPU scroll register is basically a camera positioning tool for background graphics. Pretty convenient, huh? But there's an elephant in the room, isn't there? We only provided a single byte location for each axis. How does it know which name table we are on? How does it know to wrap from the first name table to the second and from the right side of the second back to the left side of the first? As mentioned, the horizontal by vertical resolution of the NES is 256 by 240. Each value can be contained inside a single byte. 8 bits in a byte, 0 to FF in hex, 0 to 255, unsigned, in decimal. Those are our 8-bit ranges. When adding values to a byte and reaching a point where a value greater than 255 is needed, we use a second byte to hold the carry value. 255 plus 1 is 256. In hex, that would be FF plus 1 is 01 in our new high byte, and a rollover to 00 in our original low byte. For the x-axis, we use a full 256 pixels across, and need to roll into a new byte to exceed the screen's width and start counting a second screen. Super Mario Bros. needs to do this as it has to scroll horizontally to the right. Like the x-axis, we would roll the y-axis into a high byte when needed, but this time we do that when we reach 240 pixels, because the vertical resolution is only 240 pixels. So the high bytes not only indicate exceeding a screen's worth of dimensions, but also that we have moved from one name table to another. And come to think of it, we don't really need a full high byte, do we? We only need a single bit for each axis, because exceeding a screen's axis again will just wrap us back around from right to left, or bottom to top. Two bits, zero or one, a single bit for the y-axis and a single bit for the x-axis. Where do they go? This is the PPU control register. Its eight bits are used for various things, of course, and the two bits we will flex for our focus on scrolling are here, bit zero and bit one. Setting the zero bit means add 256 to the X scroll position. Setting bit one means add 240 to the Y scroll position. There are four combinations of bits and four name tables. So these values not only indicate that we have rolled over the Y axis, X axis, or both, but also what our current base name table address is for our PPU scroll coordinates. And what do you know? The arrangement of the two bits like that, Y rollover and X rollover, that indicate which name table we are in, just so happen to plug into a certain spot in the binary value of our name table address in order to select our desired name table. Almost like it was by design. Start in the 2000 name table, exceed the screen's width, flip the X overflow bit, and now we are in the 2400 name table. 
exceed this screen's width, flip the bit, and now we are back in the 2000 name table. Endless horizontal scrolling, at least as far as the PPU is concerned. So we've talked about how background tile byte values comprise the name table. VRAM inside the NES can hold two times the size of the name table plus attribute table, and therefore two screens. PPU scroll is past the X and Y coordinates to locate the scroll window. PPU controls lowest two bits indicate if we have exceeded 256 pixels on the horizontal axis, 240 pixels on the vertical axis, or both. And those same two bits from PPU control can be seen as indicating which of the four addresses we should use as our base name table when locating our PPU scroll window's position. The last major component worth mentioning is mirroring. As you may have figured out on your own, we need to take those two physical name tables and arrange them into our four logical name tables in a way that is compatible with the direction we wish to scroll. If we are scrolling horizontally, we want our second physical name table to be located to the side of our starting name table, so we wrap around on the horizontal axis. This being the case, the two name tables are said to be mirrored vertically. If we were scrolling vertically, we want our two name tables stacked on top of each other, so the name tables are mirrored horizontally. We mirror on the opposing axis that we wish to scroll. Mirroring can be configured at the hardware level in the case of an NROM PCB, for example, by bridging the appropriate pads depending on the scroll direction desired. Super Mario Bros. PCB has the H or horizontal pad soldered together as the game uses horizontal scrolling thanks to the name tables using vertical mirroring. Other PCB configurations, mapper chips, and more allow the programmer to have flexibility when it comes to configuring mirroring. Not all games configure mirroring by physically connecting two pads on their PCB. Obviously, disc games can't do that, for instance. But Mario does, so here it is. Well, that was quite the crash course on scrolling, and we really only covered the basics of graphics and left out design philosophy. Perhaps we know how to scroll, but when you scroll is a matter of game design. Hope you all enjoyed this one. Be sure to like and subscribe to see more videos like this. I also have a Patreon available for those of you that are interested, and I'll talk to you again soon.